followed the Romani Trail, which took us down the River Nile in search of the gypsies of Egypt. For centuries, they've remained undiscovered, unknown to the Egyptians themselves. But on the banks of the Nile, near the town of Luxor, we found them, living beside the temples that the pharaohs built for the sun god Amon-Ra. They live on the outskirts of town, as gypsies do everywhere. The story of their unique migration has been passed by word of mouth from father to son. Joseph Mazen is head of the Gypsy tribe in Luxor and is the keeper of his people's history. Our tribe originally came from Kurdistan. Its name was Nawar al Hamamsha and it was called Nawar because of its founder's name. Nawar is the name that applies to all our people here. From Kurdistan, we descended to Egypt many generations ago, having been cast out of our homelands because of our evil deeds and bad reputation. For in truth, we would steal and plunder and some of us were highway robbers too. We lived outside society and we kept alive our own traditions and our own language. But we were punished and driven out of Kurdistan and the Iran where our forefathers were born. In the beginning, we took after our ancestors, but we had to pay for that as the people were against us. In order to settle in Luxor, we encouraged our daughters to dance and our sons to become musicians so that would become accepted by the locals. And we invaded their hearts and their minds by our arts. Khairiya is one of the three daughters of Joseph Mazen, who became a dancer. Being from the tribe of Nawar, or Gypsy, she's an outsider from her community. The youngest daughter is Radia, with whom respectable people don't want to be seen walking, let alone talking. The oldest of the three is Soat Masan. Refused a place in polite society, Soat became the local prostitute. To try and gain some semblance of respectability, she and her sisters became professional dancers. The only time I wish I wasn't a dancer is when a man of another tribe falls in love with me or one of my sisters. His family would fight a war to stop him marrying a Ghazia, a girl of bad reputation. His family would say, how can you do such a thing to us? How could you marry a daughter of Mazen, a dancer and a singer, a girl who performs in front of others? And from the tribe of Nawar, then such a marriage become impossible. That's what hurts and makes me sometimes wish I wasn't a dancer. They call us by the name Gazia. To them, it's a dirty word. But to us, it means that we invade their hearts with our dance and in any other way they want. We don't care what they say about us because at the end of the day, we give them their money's worth and they get what they are after.
The Muzzin family, over many generations, spread across the countryside of Upper Egypt. Some of the poorest relatives live in the outskirts of the town Kus, where they're among the last people to preserve the great tradition of the epic ballad, which is fast dying out in Egypt. Said Dawi is a poet. He's passing on to his son the art of the gypsy epic singer. The story is of Abu Zaid, a dark gypsy hero with a special place in Arab culture. Said Dawi is one of the last remaining teachers of the ancient ballad. Said Dawi is a poor and unknown poet, destined to remain in his village. But one member of his tribe broke with his past and went to Cairo. He became a star of stage and screen, perhaps the most popular folk entertainer in the whole Arab world. His name is Mitkaya. Young girls climb on stage just to be seen near Mitkyle. I was born near the temple of Karnak, like the rest of my family who were poor. One day, I was told an important group of guests had come all the way from Cairo and to hear me play. Well, they heard me play and brought me to Cairo. That was my lucky day. After taking Cairo by storm, Mitkail traveled the world. In Paris, he was signed up as a star in French porno films. On his return to Cairo, he could boast no less than nine wives and 14 children.
Despite his fame, Mitkail hasn't lost touch with other poorer gypsies. The jugglers of old Cairo are called Nakrazan. They make their living from the streets as gypsies have for centuries since they left India. and his family mix with poorer gypsies in old Cairo, there are certain places where they'd never dare to go. Behind the city railway lines is the infamous district of El Hashish. It's a ghetto of the drug dealers and criminals of Cairo. Many gypsies have to live here with their families as they too are classed as undesirables. certain days, gypsies, who are never usually seen outside their ghetto areas, make their way into the local markets. They've come to make money by performing the traditional arts that gypsies carried with them on their long migrations hidden from the eyes of the law by the bustle of the market. The tattooist is one of Mitkail's brothers, continuing the gypsy trade his fathers brought from India. He's tattooing a new wife on top of the old. <laughs> Customers can select the design they want from a surprising variety. <laughs> Gypsies dance to the same two-sided drum and pipes that their nomadic forefathers brought from Rajasthan. The dancing girls are called Khawazis meaning invaders of the heart. They're a different tribe from the dancers we found in Luxor. They're believed to have entered Europe with invading armies from the Turkish Empire. They're belly dancing in the markets like their great-grandmothers did.
shows, like Punch and Judy, were carried through the world by gypsies. They do the same in England today. Their art began in India and became a part of every society they mixed with, often mocking other people's ways of life. They're discussing the virtues of wife beating, Egyptian style. The fortune tellers performing her traditional role of telling people what they want to hear and then charging them for it. So when magic or supernatural powers are called for, the Islamic community often turns to the gypsy. This procession in Old Cairo is leading to an exorcism. Gypsy musicians have been employed to chase the devil from an Egyptian girl who's suffering from an illness that modern medicine can't diagnose. This public parade is followed by the most secret of ceremonies. Entering her home for the exorcism, the girl is ritually cleansed. A bird is sacrificed to the devil. Exorcism begins as the gypsies try to identify the devil causing the girl's illness. They do this by dressing her in costumes and playing the music of different lands. If and when she falls into trance, they will have found the nationality of the devil and can banish him. First they try an Arabian costume. As she hasn't fallen into trance, they change the rhythm. To attract the devil by whetting his appetite, they add some live chickens. 
The devil still hasn't responded, so they change her costume for a Moroccan one. Next, they try a Tunisian cape. As the girl begins to react to the faster rhythms, the musicians know they've caught the devil. By now, the gypsies have performed a sort of spiritual journey through the costumes and music of the lands of their ancient migrations to and from Cairo. Outside the city, near the oasis of Fayoum, are the tribes of nomadic gypsies who still travel through Africa, taking their music with them. These are total outcasts, neither speaking the local language nor following the Islamic faith. To escape the persecution that still follows them, they travel today in the company of other nomads, following the roots of their original migrations, but disguising their identity for fear of persecution in new lands. If gypsies